If the individual, overwhelmed by the sense of his own puniness and impotence, should feel that his life has lost its meaning, which after all is not surprising, then he is already on the way to recognizing the validity of the individuation process. How does one find meaning in the endless sea of the unknown? How can mortals stand tall in the face of adversity and gaze into the abyss without being consumed by madness and psychosis? Are we the slaves of our own sensory limitations? Do good and evil exist outside of the realm of our perception? Can there be light without darkness? Are we a drop in an ocean or the ocean in a drop? And could it be that the beginning is also the end? In Jungian psychology, all apparently opposing forces, all conflicts and all paradoxes have their resolution in an underlying unity. And to experience this unity, according to Jung, one must walk the path of the alchemists and the druids, the path of the enlightened Buddha and of the ancient hermetic hierophants. The path towards spiritual reconciliation, a path steeped in symbolism and allegory. A journey guarded by a sea of archetypes that hide the legendary Holy Grail treasured by the Round Table Knights of King Arthur and the ever sought after Philosopher's Stone of the Rosicrucians. The mystical path to individuation. Welcome to Agrippa's Diary, the gathering place for mystical seekers. Jung, probably the most influential psychiatrist and psychoanalyst to have ever walked the earth, introduced the concept of individuation for the first time in 1921. Using this intricate concept, Jung aimed to explain how individuals develop a distinct and integrated identity separate from societal norms, expectations, or collective psychology. In a nutshell, the process of individuation involves the integration of the conscious and unconscious parts of the mind, which includes both personal and collective unconscious elements. In two essays in Analytical Psychology, Carl Jung described this complex psychological journey as follows. Individuation means becoming an individual, and insofar as individuality embraces our innermost, last and incomparable uniqueness, it also implies becoming one's own self. We could therefore translate individuation as coming to selfhood. As described by Jung, the ultimate goal of individuation is psychological wholeness, achieved when all of a person's latent potentials are actualized and all elements of the unconscious are brought to the light of consciousness and integrated harmoniously into their character. It's an ongoing process of self-realization and development, which lasts throughout a person's lifetime. It's a higher goal to strive towards, a source of meaning. Individuation requires an honest, ongoing relationship with oneself and involves coming to terms with both the visible and hidden aspects of one's character. This dynamic process unfolds throughout a person's life, always inching closer but never in a linear way. That's because the human psyche is comprised of a multifaceted array of elements, each interacting with the other to form a holistic self. The primary components involved in this process are the ego, the personal unconscious, the shadow, the anima and animus, and the self. Let's explain each, so that we can have a foundation to build upon. The ego is the conscious facet of the mind. It consists of the thoughts, memories and emotions of which an individual is consciously aware. While it acts as the locus of consciousness, the ego represents only a portion of the entire psyche, rather than its totality. The personal unconscious refers to the stratum of the unconscious that harbors memories and experiences. These elements, once part of our conscious mind, have since been forgotten or suppressed. The personal unconscious also houses what Jung termed complexes, which are intertwined patterns of thoughts, feelings and perceptions that emerge from significant personal experiences. The shadow is a repository for all aspects that the ego disowns or fails to identify with. It often conceals traits that the individual deems undesirable or shameful, hidden away from conscious acknowledgement. The anima and animus are the contrasexual facets of the psyche, symbolizing the feminine inner personality in men, anima, and the masculine inner personality in women, animus. And finally, the self acts as the central archetype. The self signifies the comprehensive totality of the psyche. It encapsulates both the conscious and unconscious mind, embodying the facet of personality that incessantly strives for unity, wholeness, and self-realization. 
The self is often experienced as a profound sense of integration and completeness, symbolized in spiritual alchemy by the philosopher's stone. In this context, individuation can be compared to the process of alchemical transmutation. Carl Jung writes, I hold the view that the alchemist's hope of conjuring out of matter the philosophical gold, or the panacea, or the wonderful stone, was only in part an illusion, an effect of projection. For the rest, it corresponded to certain psychic facts that are of great importance in the psychology of the unconscious. As is shown by the texts and their symbolism, the alchemist projected what I have called the process of individuation into the phenomena of chemical change. So, how does one initiate this transformation? According to Jung, fundamentally, this is a process that occurs naturally, but it can become a conscious process. In answer to Job, Carl Jung writes, the difference between the natural individuation process, which runs its course unconsciously, and the one which is consciously realized, is tremendous. In the first case, consciousness nowhere intervenes. The end remains as dark as the beginning. In the second case, so much darkness comes to light that the personality is permeated with light, and consciousness necessarily gains in scope and insight. But this, in turn, requires a high degree of awareness and going through the potentially painful process of metaphorically slaying our persona. The persona refers to the societal facade we adopt to integrate into our community. This construct starts developing early in our lives when societal pressures compel us to align with personality traits that resonate with contemporary social values, dismissing those that contradict societal standards. Jung clearly states that, fundamentally the persona is nothing real, it is a compromise between the individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. He takes a name, earns a title, represents an office, he is this or that. In a certain sense, all this is real, yet in relation to the essential individuality of the person concerned, it is only a secondary reality, a product of compromise, in making which others often have a greater share than he. The persona is a semblance, a two-dimensional reality. However, the issue arises when individuals reach a point where they identify themselves solely with this social facade, thereby isolating themselves from their profound psychological dimensions. Hence, it is crucial for those aspiring to follow the deliberate route of personal growth to realize that their societal facade merely symbolizes a fragment of their comprehensive personality. Jung writes, One cannot individuate as long as one is playing a role to oneself. The convictions one has about oneself are the most subtle form of persona and the most subtle obstacle against any true individuation. One can admit practically anything, yet somewhere one retains the idea that one is nevertheless so-and-so, and this is always a sort of final argument which counts apparently as a plus. Yet it functions as an influence against true individuation. It's important to note that the individuation process is unique to every individual but it typically involves several key steps. The journey towards individuation first calls for a profound encounter with oneself, a process we term as self-reflection. This confrontation with the self, however, is no frivolous undertaking. It is akin to descending into an abyss, peeling back the layers of our conscious identity to reveal the raw, unvarnished truths that lie beneath. It is a deep dive into the realm of our psyche, illuminating the unknown with the light of conscious awareness. This process demands a level of introspection that can sometimes seem disconcerting. It is an unrelenting quest for truth within oneself, a quest that requires first and foremost an unwavering commitment to honesty. One must be prepared to question every known aspect of their existence, scrutinizing thoughts, beliefs and feelings in a ceaseless exploration of the self. Self-reflection, therefore, is not merely a step towards individuation, but rather the foundation upon which the edifice of our true self is built. Yet this journey is not undertaken alone or unsupported. The tools one can employ to navigate this labyrinth of self are manifold. Journaling, for example, serves as a mirror to our consciousness, reflecting our innermost thoughts and emotions in stark black and white. It allows us to articulate, to structure, and hence to understand the chaos of our internal landscape. Meditation offers a pathway to silence, a space to observe and understand the ebb and flow of our thoughts and feelings without judgment or expectation. 
In this silent communion with our psyche, we begin to discern patterns, understand triggers, and appreciate the cyclical nature of our emotions. The practice of dream analysis too serves as a valuable ally on this journey. Our dreams are the echoes of our unconscious mind, offering tantalizing glimpses into the parts of ourselves that remain concealed in our waking hours. Carl Jung writes, our dreams are like windows that allow us to look in or to listen in to that psychological process which is continually going on in our unconscious. When interpreting the narrative of dreams, one gives voice to the unspoken and shape to the formless, translating the language of the unconscious into the vocabulary of conscious comprehension. Dreams are impartial, spontaneous products of the unconscious psyche outside the control of the will. They are pure nature. They show us the unvarnished, natural truth and are therefore fitted as nothing else is to give us back an attitude that accords with our basic human nature when our consciousness has strayed too far from its foundations and run into an impasse. The shadow, as mentioned earlier, represents those hidden aspects of our personality lurking in the unconscious realm that the conscious ego chooses not to acknowledge. These elements, encompassing both positive and negative traits, behaviors, or thoughts, are often overlooked or outright rejected due to their discordance with our self-perceived identity. It is the unknown dark side that is often at odds with societal norms and expectations, thus leading to its disassociation from the conscious self. Engaging in shadow work, then, involves embarking on a challenging yet profound journey of recognition, confrontation, and integration of these shadow aspects into our conscious awareness. It calls for deep introspection, a willingness to unmask the parts of ourselves that lie in the darkness and often that we find discomforting or even abhorrent. Shadow work is far from a destructive process. It is a therapeutic path towards self-understanding and acceptance. Through shadow work, one can illuminate the hidden corridors of the psyche, facing the shadows lurking therein, liberating himself from the shackles of unconscious fears, limitations, and self-destructive patterns. This process, though fraught with discomfort, holds the potential to cultivate an enriching growth of self-awareness and psychological maturation. To engage the shadow is not to annihilate it, but to assimilate it. It involves interacting with the shadow and understanding its nature, origins, and intentions. It requires humility, patience, and compassion toward oneself. As one makes peace with their shadow, they begin to see it not as an adversary, but as a guide towards holistic self-understanding. The anima and animus, as expounded by Jung, are intriguing constituents of the unconscious mind. They represent the feminine and masculine psychological aspects, respectively, and reside deep within our psyche, beneath the veil of conscious cognizance. According to Jung, these elements aren't bound by the constraints of one's biological sex, but rather are universal facets inherent to every individual. The anima, often regarded as the inner woman in a man, signifies the embodiment of all feminine psychological tendencies within the male psyche, including aspects such as empathy, intuition, and cooperation. The anima symbolizes the unconscious feminine qualities that a man possesses, and its interaction with the conscious mind can impact his relationships with women and his understanding of the feminine world. On the other hand, the animus, or the inner man in a woman, stands for the collective masculine psychological tendencies within the female psyche, including attributes such as assertiveness, rationality, and analytical thinking. The animus is more than a mere aggregation of male attributes. It is an expression of the unconscious masculine tendencies that exist within every woman, guiding her interactions with men and her perception of the masculine world. Carl Jung writes, The natural function of the animus as well as of the anima is to remain in place between individual consciousness and the collective unconscious. Exactly as the persona is a sort of stratum between the ego consciousness and the objects of the external world. The animus and the anima should function as a bridge or a door leading to the images of the collective unconscious as the persona should be a sort of bridge into the world. The encounter with the anima or animus in one's psyche isn't a simple straightforward process. It requires a conscious effort to acknowledge and harmonize these energies within oneself. Integration of these archetypal images may initially stir cognitive dissonance and inner turmoil, but it is through this confrontation 
that an individual can achieve a more comprehensive understanding of their own psyche and gender identity. In fact, the existence of the anima and animus is nothing more than a law of the microcosm. According to the seven hermetic principles explained in the Kybalion by the three initiates, who essentially build upon the ancient hermetic texts, this is a byproduct of the law of gender. The hermetic laws go beyond the individual's psyche and apply to everything in the universe. The principle of gender posits that the masculine and feminine principles are always at work, not just in people, but also in the minerals, vegetables, the animal kingdom, and even in the mental planes. When studying the works of Carl Jung, one may not stop but wonder if his theories are not just a further expansion of the ancient teachings of the past. Another example is the principle of polarity, which states that everything is dual, everything has poles, everything has its pair of opposites. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. This principle bears similarities to Jung's ideas about conflict and reconciliation of opposites within the psyche, which is a central theme in his work. But I digress. If you want to explore this narrative further, I suggest you watch my video on Carl Jung and his secret Masonic lineage, where I provide further evidence to support these parallels. Finally, the encounter with the self signifies a paramount stage in the ongoing journey towards individuation. It represents the momentous confluence of the conscious and unconscious mind, a profound alignment akin to a rare celestial event marking the passage of personal evolution. In the labyrinth of the psyche, the self emerges as the embodiment of an internal symphony, harmonizing the dissonant notes of consciousness and unconsciousness. Its encounter is not merely a casual chance meeting, but a deeply transformative experience, a rendezvous that irrevocably changes the landscape of one's inner world. It may well be compared to a moment of enlightenment when one catches a glimpse of the entire universe contained within the prism of their mind. Experiencing the self often feels like a sublime spiritual moment. It is akin to a deep sea dive into the dark waters of one's psyche, an intimate exploration of the subterranean caverns of the mind. The encounter, however, is not without its shadows. One must traverse the hinterlands of personal fears and traverse the wilderness of subconscious desires. Yet when the conscious ego meets the self, there arises an intrinsic profound recognition. It is as if a mirror has been held up to the ego, revealing not a fragmented reflection but a complete, holistic image. It is a sense of divine unity, where one begins to perceive a tapestry of interconnectedness weaving through the individual threads of their being. In this state of heightened awareness, the ego and the self merge, inviting a profound sense of oneness. The world as we know it seems to dissolve into an array of mystical insights bringing forth a resounding affirmation of our unity with the cosmos. This union is not a mere philosophical abstraction, but a tangible, lived experience, one that infuses life with a sense of purpose, meaning, and wholeness. Ultimately, encountering the self invites a renaissance of the soul, a rebirth that often feels akin to a spiritual awakening. This transcendental experience heralds a new dawn of self-understanding, paving the path toward integration, self-realization, and a heightened state of consciousness. The grandeur of the human journey towards individuation culminates in the stage of self-realization, an emblem of the harmonious synthesis of all facets of one's personality, conscious and unconscious alike. However, this pinnacle is not a final destination to be reached, but rather a genesis, a birthing point of a renewed consciousness that illuminates the path to continuous self-discovery and personal growth. In this majestic state of self-realization, one is no longer divided but attains unity, a profound wholeness that transcends the dichotomy of the conscious and unconscious mind. The veil between these two realms is lifted, allowing a transcendent awareness to emerge. This awareness is a direct recognition of the self as it truly is, unfiltered by the distortions of conditioned thought patterns and societal expectations. As this realization deepens, one begins to embrace the totality of their being, moving beyond mere identification with their persona, the outward face we present to the world. The complex tapestry of traits, experiences and perspectives, some previously hidden in the shadow, becomes an acknowledged part of the self. 
The fears, desires, and potentialities that reside within the unconscious mind are welcomed into the light of conscious awareness. The process of self-realization, therefore, is not a journey of becoming something more, but rather a journey of unveiling and acknowledging what has always been there. It is the authentic acceptance of one's humanity in its fullness, with all its triumphs and tribulations, virtues and vices, potentialities and imperfections. It is about acknowledging and embracing one's inner reality, a reality that remains ever dynamic and ever evolving. The experience of self-realization is akin to a return to the source, to the quintessential essence of our being. It is a homecoming, a reconciliation with our true nature. This realization instills a deep sense of peace and fulfillment, bringing about a liberation from the constraints and constructions of the ego. Individuation is a mystical journey, a source of meaning that has been practiced in various forms by many civilizations, some now extinct, for thousands of years. It is by no means a new concept, but depending on the age we find ourselves in, it has been presented in various forms and practices. Carl Jung merely brought it to light in this form in an era of cynicism, spiritual decay and alienation from our true origins and his approach is worth the time of any mystical seeker. In a nutshell, this is what all religions of the world strive to teach us, that we are all part of an endless dance of birth, death and rebirth, and that by climbing the steps of self-awareness we can get closer and closer to the truth and finally, when our time is over, gracefully and harmoniously reunite with the One. Now, all of this considered, I'm also interested to hear your opinion. Do you think Carl Jung's theories build upon the mystical teachings of the ancients? Share your thoughts in the comments below. I'm eager to hear your thoughts, fellow mystic. If you want to delve deeper into the world of ancient wisdom and esotericism, be sure to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more insightful videos. And if you want to support my mission to unearth and decipher the forgotten teachings of the ancient mysteries and the encrypted knowledge of Western esotericism, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Until next time, continue to seek out the light. Hen to Pan.